Good day, everybody. My name is Larry Schofield, and it's with uh, great uh, honor for me to be able to introduce your next speaker, which is Professor Halil Jalan. He's a professor of civil engineering and the director of the Program for Sustainable Pavement Engineering and Research at Iowa State University. His research focuses on several aspects of transportation infrastructure systems, including analysis, design, construction, and performance evaluation of pavement systems. He has been with ISU since August of 2002 and has been involved with over 115 research projects worth over almost $21 million of project funds and has produced over 340 peer-reviewed publications and over 350 presentations and over 100 invited talks. Dr. Jalan serves as the chair of the ASCE Geo Institute Payments Committee and ASCE Transportation and Development Institute Unmanned Aerial Systems Impacts Task Force Committee. And he's gonna be talking to us today on the effect of beneficial use of concrete grinding residue on transportation infrastructure systems. I will turn it over to him. Okay, uh, thank you, Larry, for the introduction. It's great, uh, you know, pleasure to be a speaker for the uh, IGGA annual meeting. And I would like to share some of our research findings on this uh, topic. Thank you again for kindly inviting me to be part of the uh, program. And I would like to acknowledge uh, good number of uh, researchers, uh, our former PhD students and collaborators uh, involved with these uh, uh, research uh, studies that I will be talking about. And uh, some of them are still with us. Some of them are our former uh, PhD students. And we still have some ongoing projects uh, uh, on this topic. And my colleagues, Dr. Bora Chetin and Michael Paris uh, uh, are still collaborators and we still continue to work on this topic. And I will be talking about those studies in upcoming slides. And we appreciate again all their contributions. And we also would like to acknowledge uh, our sponsoring agencies uh, Minnesota Department of Transportation, uh, Minnesota Local Road Research Board, and all the guidance and support provided by our technical advisory panel. And David Hansen from Minnesota DOT was our uh, technical liaison for the uh, MINDOT study. And uh, we have ongoing research projects funded by the Iowa Highway Research Board, the Iowa DOT. And as you can see, we have a good number of colleagues uh, providing support and guidance as part of the Technical Advisory Committee. And uh, Brian Moore is the lead for this uh, study as our uh, technical contact. And this study is focusing on the use of concrete grinding residue as a soil amendment. And uh, this is the outline of my presentation that I will be following. And with that, starting with the background, uh, as many of you again know, uh, diamond grinding is a technique uh, to smooth concrete payment systems and it uh, restores uh, and improves the right quality and it improves the surface characteristics of concrete payment systems, reducing road noise, uh, enhancing the surface texture and improves the uh, road uh, longevity. And on the right hand side here, you can see, you know, a concrete, um, you know, the grinding procedure done in the field. And uh, and again, continuing with the background, uh, CGR, concrete grinding residue, is a slurry byproduct of this uh, grinding process. As we, you know, the say they take out the rough spots uh, from a concrete payment system. And this also happens when we do saw cutting of the joints uh, in the concrete uh, payments. And so the CGR material is a combination of the, uh, uh, say the uh, cooling, uh, you know, the grinding plates, the, the water is used for such purposes. And, uh, uh, you know, the, there are uh, some materials like silica, cadmium, and other uh, chemical components, uh, uh, you know, the, as part of this, uh, say the process. And it may be a concern from uh, environmental uh, perspective uh, on this. Uh, you know, the, as supplementary cementitious materials and other uh, materials are uh, included within the concrete mix design. And um, review of concrete grinding residue management uh, say the practices. 
And as part of our studies, we actually evaluated a number of uh, technical reports and uh, technical briefs, uh, publications, and uh, also provided by the International Grinding and Grooving Association Best Management Practices, how this material can be spread along the vegetated roadside slopes uh, or decanted in settlement ponds or other, you know, the say the techniques and we have a, you know, the documentation of those in our, uh, say, the technical reports and publications. In terms of the state practices, uh, there is quite a bit of actually variation, and we actually visited uh, almost all state DOTs and how they actually uh, handle uh, CGR material and what kind of guidance that they provide. And uh, so I'm going to be showing a summary of those in upcoming, uh, you know, the data slides. And we also did some questionnaire surveys uh, to have the best understanding of these uh, practices. And as you can see here, uh, uh, different states have different uh, uh, practices in terms of, you know, the how they handle the uh, what kind of prohibited areas. Uh, uh, you know, in terms of offloading this CGR material and, you know, how it needs to be disposed of, the CGR. And as you can see, some states do require disposal in ponds and others allow in the off-site, you know, the city disposal. And how, who makes that decision, whether it's determined by the specifications or the contractor or a combination of a contractor and the engineer and how it needs to be, you know, the road surface cleaning needs to be handled and other, you know, the, any other uh, control of the CGR property. So there is actually a good documentation of this uh, available in our uh, technical reports. You can easily uh, type the keywords, uh, you know, uh, as part of our research project titles and the Minnesota DOT study was completed in uh, early 2019 and uh, the high highway research board studies are still ongoing and we hope to get done with those studies in 2021. And this is, as you can see in alphabetical order, the first page of these practices and continuing with Michigan and other states here on the second page, pretty much follows the, you know, the similar guidelines between different states. And then this is the last page of it. So if we summarize these, uh, you know, the city practices, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, there are quite a bit of variations uh, in CGR management uh, from state to state. And, you know, the, in terms of impact to the environment, construction materials and design methodologies. So when we look into these, uh, you know, the 50 states, eight of them had no regulations for managing CGR at the time that we concluded our study last year. And 29 states uh, emphasized the prohibition of CGR flow into the drainage facilities or sensitive areas due to the concerns with the slurry material. And as you can see, uh, 12 states allowed the roadside offloading and 11 states allowed pond decanting and eight states allowed, you know, the waste facility processing. And 12 states, uh, uh, contractors and engineers were required to provide uh, a methodology for CGR disposal so that they can minimize the risk to the uh, environment. So that's just a big picture summary of that. And continuing again with a uh, summary of the state practices. And in many states, CGR disposal methodologies were flexible and you know, they lacked a detailed guideline and control actions. And overall, the negative impacts of CGR on plant, plant growth and soil properties were not well studied. And that was one of the motivating factor for the you know, for the studies that we've been involved with, uh, especially the Minnesota DOT funded research project that we wrapped up in 2019. And there are variable characteristics of CGR due to the changes in the mix design, different parts of the uh, highways and the uh, states and the country. And, you know, the and then the environmental issues depending on these materials uh, and, uh, you know, the uh, and, and the impact of it in the concrete, uh, you know, the city production. So there are few states like Michigan, Nebraska, and North Carolina allowed to recycle and reuse of the CGR in some land applications and construction field. 
And those are some other, you know, the findings that we had as part of our, uh, say, the review of these uh, state practices. Now, continuing with the case studies, uh, and again, I will start with the Minnesota DOT funded uh, study. The title of our research project was Concrete Grinding Residue, its effect on roadside vegetation and soil properties. And uh, the problem statement given to us was that, you know, uh, the potential, uh, uh, you know, the projects were coming up by the Minnesota DOT uh, and, um, and they wanted to see, you know, what uh, impact that CGR slurries have on Minnesota roadsides. And in the, you know, the previous studies uh, before our project started, there were areas that the CGR material were offloaded into the road site and uh, on plant communities and soil sites. And they wanted to understand the impact of this uh, and see what the end uh, result was. Uh, and they also wanted to uh, allow us to go and visit the live projects where we can actually collect CGR material and document the offloading procedure and all that. So, and there, these were their, uh, say, the goals as part of this study. And, uh, you know, to see if there was any impact, uh, reduced density of vegetation resulting from these erosion problems. And, uh, you know, the, the impact of slurry to uh, uh, native vegetation or non-native grasses and see what happens actually after the CGR application to these, uh, you know, the uh, plants. And, uh, you know, are there potential to increase the maintenance costs with this, you know, the CD with these uh, uh, procedures? And so based on those, you know, the say the items that I just covered, uh, the objectives of their study was to gain a stronger understanding of the CGR effects on soil properties. And, uh, you know, for example, the uh, infiltration uh, and also the impact on plant communities, for example, vegetation growth uh, and through institute and, you know, the statistical uh, analysis. They asked us to analyze the soil physical and chemical properties and assess the vegetation biomass, uh, especially after the placement of the CGR in the field and see what kind of impact was out there. So we also wanted to have a controlled section uh, and we chose that to uh, in a location very close to Iowa State University here in Ames, Iowa, Kelly Farm. And as you can see on this aerial image captured by our drones, and we had these, you know, the uh, four by four, uh, 16, you know, the uh, uh, plant uh, uh, communities, uh, and we chose different application rates uh, according to this CGR uh, application uh, test plan. The uh, areas shown with A, uh, here is the control, and you can see the distribution of those here. And uh, areas shown with B is the application rate of, this is the dry application rate, by the way, 10 ton per acre. And then the C is 20 ton per acre, and D is a high rate of application, 40 ton per acre. We also had five measurements, uh, and before any uh, CGR slurry application, the documentation of the site, one month after the uh, slurry application and six months after the application and one year after the application. We also were able to go there, uh, you know, in addition to the efforts listed in our research project, one and a half, two years after the, you know, the application, document the conditions in the field. And as shown on this, you know, the say the map of the site, each one of these uh, say the uh, test areas was about six feet by six feet. And then, you know, that there is actually, uh, uh, you know, the distance between these areas so that the different application rates with uh, infiltration and the migration of these materials are not going to impact so that each one of these areas is going to serve uh, whatever the original application rate was. And so we had an in-depth analysis of the plant species, uh, identification of those and the biomass measurements uh, before, after, and again, different time intervals. Look into the uh, soil physical properties, uh, such as bulk density and hydraulic conductivity, and then the soil chemical properties. Uh, pH is obviously an important uh, property because of the, 
uh, you know, the, say, the pH properties of the CGR and uh, alkalinity, uh, electrical conductivity, cation exchange capacity, uh, uh, exchangeable sodium percentage and percent base saturation. So these were the properties that we were after. And uh, in terms of the properties of the CGR and soil at the Kelly Farm site, and you can see them on this uh, table, and uh, actual soil classification, we're talking about silty, clay, uh, gravel, sand, A26, uh, according to ASHTO classification, and clay, sand, according to unified soil classification. And you can see the specific gravity and other properties on this, you know, the, say the uh, table, what kind of clay content, for example, existed at the site, uh, and plasticity index, and other uh, properties. As you can see, the pH of the soil uh, was uh, 5.6. And if you look into the CGR, uh, CGR is a high pH value, uh, 11.7, and it had a clay uh, uh, concentration of, of about 14%. And you can see the, it's mostly a sand silt mix, uh, you know, the city uh, material. And uh, here is the distribution of this material uh, and uh, grain size distribution. You can see it uh, on the right hand side. And uh, in terms of the, uh, say, the composition of this material, according to, to our laboratory investigation, and you can see the different materials uh, in terms of quartzite, uh, calcite, dolomite, uh, albite, and uh, microcline that exist on this, uh, you know, this say, the material. And you can see the, uh, say, the distribution here on this, uh, say, the table and different percentages, what concentration of these materials uh, existed. And obviously, you know, the biggest concentration here with the 53% silicium oxide. And, um, so we had a statistical analysis for biomass and soil infiltrability. And uh, as you all know, if the, if the p-value is still, uh, smaller than 0.05, it means that the a significant effect is uh, detected. And uh, so we had this, uh, again, the biomass investigation starting with control sites and different application rates. And as you can see, the p-values uh, in all these uh, say the, uh, areas was uh, greater than 0.05. And when it comes to the uh, say the uh, infiltrability, and you know a similar picture here, uh, control and different application rates, and again all of the p-values were higher than 0.05 here. So that means that you know the uh, a significant effect was not detected for these uh, you know investigations for these properties. And uh, continuing now with, uh, you know, this is the bulk density. And you can see the values for the control and the different application rates and how they, uh, you know, they varied. And again, all the p-values were here, you know, higher than 0.05. And same thing goes with the saturated hydraulic conductivity as well. And uh, in terms of soil chemical properties, uh, and now you start seeing p-values, you know, being less than 0.05, and those values are highlighted with the, uh, you know, the asterisk star sign here. And for example, the electrical conductivity uh, and uh, the application of CGR had a significant impact here. And, uh, you know, the uh, alkalinity, as you can imagine, with the pH values of the CGR had an impact. Same thing with the cation exchange capacity and other properties. You can just, uh, you know, this, you see them here. And initial stage, one month, six month, and one year after the application rates. And you can just see over the time how they vary it. But in many cases here on these, you know, this, the properties, CGR had a, um, you know, the significant effect. And um, now looking into the, uh, say, the metal concentrations in soil, and you can see the, again the initial stage here for different, you know, the, say, the elements, materials, and at different depths also. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is one month, six month, and one year, uh, say, the, after the application, and the uh, CGR depth and interaction, CGR application depth and interaction. And again, the, you know, the, say the areas having a significant effect uh, has been marked with the asterisk sign, and you can see them on this, you know, this table as part of our investigation. 
and the key findings based on our, you know, this uh, uh, study was that uh, plant biomass for the uh, 10 ton per acre CGR rate is larger than for the control treatment. And with higher CGR rates, uh, the uh, plant growth was uh, inhibited. Uh, but overall, CGR did not significantly influence uh, soil physical properties. And, uh, and again, as part of the, say, the uh, statistical analysis, CGR significantly influenced the pH uh, and electrical conductivity, alkalinity, level of metals present, uh, cation exchange capacity, uh, exchangeable sodium percentage and percent base uh, saturation. An effect of CGR on soil chemical properties are influenced by the application rate and soil depth, time after CGR application and CGR source. And again, based on the study limitations of our study, there is not a major concern if discharge rate is less than 40 tons per uh, acre. And now I'm going to continue with the Iowa Highway Research Board uh, sponsored uh, uh, case studies. And this one is focusing on the use of concrete grinding residue as a soil amendment. And this portion is going to focus on the laboratory investigation. And the problem statement for this, uh, you know, the study was that, and again, uh, the inappropriate disposal of the CGR may uh, cause some uh, environmental issues, uh, especially in environmentally sensitive areas, uh, due to, again, the, any metals being present in it and uh, the high pH value. But we know that there are some, uh, you know, there's a, a significant potential for reuse of this uh, material as a soil stabilizer and due to its properties. And we want to see if you can evaluate the possibility of using CGR for recycling for soil stabilization purposes. And that's what this study is uh, focusing on. And again, for this study, we uh, uh, say they considered two soil types, and you can see their properties. One of them is a typical soil A6, and again, clay silt uh, here in Midwest portion in Iowa. And then the second soil was an A4, and uh, you know the silt is sent uh, with with clay, and and the uh, you can see also the CGR properties included in this study. And obviously, you know, the soils considered here as certain plasticity, but CGR is a non-plastic material. And again, uh, the, the significant difference between the pH of these soils and the pH of the CGR and other properties are presented here. And uh, so this is actually a really nice sh chart showing how uh, Atterberg limits vary with uh, different concentrations of the CGR. As you can see, starting with the control, which, uh, you know, 0% of CGR and all the way up to 40%. And you can see that as we increase the CGR content, the plasticity index, the difference between liquid limit and uh, plastic uh, limit is actually decreasing. As you can see here is 16 on the left hand. When we go to 40% application rate, it goes down to eight. And this is with soil one and uh, a similar effect is being seen on the right hand side. And again, now this soil is less, you know, the plastic compared to the one on the left and the value of plasticity index went from seven to five as we increase the, you know, the CGR content. And you can also see what happens to the Alterberg limits, the change uh, is taking place with different application rates. And compaction characteristics and uh, the maximum dry density due to the specific gravity of the CGR being lower than the, uh, say the uh, specific gravity of the soils. As we increase the CGR content, uh, dry unit weight of these soils are gradually going down. Uh, uh, and you can see these values also presented at the optimal moisture content, OMC, and the maximum dry density values are also presented in the vertical axis here on the left-hand side. And again, these are the results for soil one, and these are the results for soil two. Overall, they follow a similar trend. And in terms of the impact on unconfined compressive strength, please keep in mind that we were, uh, you know, the trying to see uh, beneficial uses of CGR here. And we wanted to see what kind of impact is out there on the uh, strength of these materials. And as you can see, starting it again with the control, uh, uh, say the soil with uh, no CGR in them, 
and gradually increasing with 5% intervals all the way to 40%. At about 20% application rate, we see the maximum strength for these soils. So that tells us the pretty much the optimum application rate, um, you know, the, for the CGR materials. With uh, about 20% application rate, we're seeing the, you know, the highest strength value for these uh, two soil types investigated as part of this study in the laboratory environment. And the, in terms of the impact on the pH, uh, soils, uh, you know, that have a lower uh, pH value as we uh, start uh, adding CGR into these, uh, you know, soils, the pH is gradually increasing, as you can see, uh, for soil one and soil two. With about 40% application rate with soil two, the pH is about, you know, the 10 uh, when it's just applied and then it gradually goes down if you take the measurements at seven day triangle and 28 day with the, uh, you know, the square dots there. And so how does this uh, soil stabilization uh, happening with the application of CGR? And again, based on our laboratory investigation, uh, when we do the scanning electron microscope uh, 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 testing, and you can see in these areas shown in these circles that calcium silicate hydrate CSH uh, gel formation is taking place. And again, we wanted to target the maximum strength, and that was happening with about 20%, uh, you know, they say the application rates. And you can see it for soil one and soil two uh, here. And here is the view of the pure CGR according to SEM. And the key findings from this study was that uh, in terms of soil stabilization in the laboratory environment, we see a decrease in soil plasticity as shown in those earlier graphs that I covered, and then a, a decrease in maximum dry density. And we do see an improvement uh, uh, in soil strength and California bearing ratio. And 20% turn out to be optimum application, application rate for these two soils studied, uh, uh, in, included in this study. And we also see an increase in soil pH as expected uh, uh, and alkalinity uh, and, uh, you know, the cation exchange capacity and electrical conductivity. And CSH gel formation is absorbed according to the uh, SEM and EDS tests. And that explains us the mechanism uh, in the soil stabilization. And it is a combination of flocculation, cement hydration and rehydration, and pozzolanic reactions are the uh, factors leading to the increase in the soil strength. And now I would like to continue with our, uh, say, the use of concrete grinding ratio as a soil amendment and ongoing field investigation. These studies have not been uh, uh, finalized yet. We actually had our first uh, field applications uh, this past uh, summer, and we will continue to observe these sites. And we have additional sites that we would like to go and apply CGR uh, next spring and next summer and then you know, the, uh, conclude this study. The problem statement here is again, uh, to see the beneficial uses of CGR in terms of uh, as a stabilizing age agent uh, in actual field conditions. And uh, you know, this obviously includes the application and the construction of these uh, test sections and see what kind of uh, results that we get uh, from these uh, test areas. And you know the objectives here is uh, how we can strategize the field application process for CGR and evaluate the field performance uh, uh, in, uh, applied into the payment uh, shoulder areas. And so for this study, uh, we identified uh, two counties. And again, we appreciate all the support and guidance provided by our technical advisor committee. And so these test sections are 250 feet in length and five feet in width. And the first uh, site was in Washington County. And we had two different CGR application scenarios. One of them is a CGR reclaimed section. Another one is applying the CGR on top of the shoulder material. And uh, so the CGR reclaimed section was constructed by mixing the settled CGR residue uh, with the top two inches of the shoulder materials. And uh, in the other scenario, the CGR on the top section was constructed as half-inch settled CGR material 
applied on the uh, top of the PM and shoulder material. We also had a base one treated section. Base one is a soil stabilizing agent so that we can actually compare and contrast the results, uh, you know, as uh, our aim is for soil stabilization purposes. And um, so here are some visual in, uh, visuals in terms of how we prepared the uh, super bags uh, uh, filled with uh, say the CGR residue. And we use these bags for, uh, you know, this, it is a secondary containment and for transportation purposes. And you can see these, uh, you know, this is a CGR material filled in these, uh, you know, this is a super bags and being carried to the project site. And uh, so uh, CGR material were uh, collected from ongoing uh, uh, diamond grinding uh, activities that was taking place on a concrete road in Washington uh, County. And again, we filled these uh, bags with this material and you can see the, uh, see the super bags filled with the CGR residue and transported to them uh, to the uh, project site. You can see them being offloaded here at the construction site. And uh, so we tried different ways of, uh, you know, the getting the water uh, out of these super bags. And the, as you can imagine, due to its, uh, say, the heavier weight, uh, the CGR material were collected towards the bottom of these bags. And we got the freestanding water out of here and the watering process uh, with our research team. And then the scheduled, uh, you know, the, say, the CGR, uh, we formed a slurry. And then, you know, that we took this material and applied again in two different ways. One of them is in a reclaimed manner, other one is the applying on top of the, uh, say, the uh, shoulder materials. And here is the reclaimed, uh, you know, the, say, the section. And again, these sections are 50 feet by uh, 250 feet. And uh, say, the, uh, you know, the ranging in, in terms of the length. And uh, you can see these, you know, the every 50 feet, uh, we place these super bags uh, and then so that we can cover this uh, five feet wide and 250 feet, uh, uh, you know, in length, uh, you know, this is the payment shoulder for stabilization purposes. And again, by taking advantage of our laboratory study, we were using the 20% target application rate uh, so that we can actually get the maximum, you know, the say the soil stabilizing uh, beneficial use of the CGR. And uh, here are again the additional images on the, so the transporting and handling the CGR was our biggest challenge here. And, you know, with these, uh, say the super bags, and then as you can see, the CGR material is being, uh, say the offloaded here. And then we need to use the construction equipment to distribute the CGR with the blading and, you know, the, this road hog, uh, you know, this the construction equipment. And, uh, and again, you can see the pictures here, how the CGR material was, well, uh, was leveled and compacted. And uh, here the, you can see the final product. Uh, and this section here, you can see the CGR treated section, and here is the control untreated section. And, uh, you know, the, this is the final CGR reclaimed section, and you can see the view from there. And uh, in other areas, uh, we uh, formed a windrow as shown in this, uh, you know, this the image here, uh, the, uh, just before the CGR application. And again, we took these super bags uh, and filled with the CGR material. And then you can see that we uh, unloaded in those areas so that, you know, the, we can actually apply the CGR into those sections. And here is again the CGR application on top section applying on top of this shoulder material and uh, mixing and blading of the CGR material. And here is the view from the final CGR treated section after the CGR application. So we want to document the use of the CGR uh, under these field conditions. And as you can see, the base one stabilizing agent was used, CGR plant reclaimed section and CGR applied on top of the, uh, say the uh, shoulder materials. And we, we documented seven days and 28 days after application. Uh, and uh, because this was a field testing, obviously weather conditions uh, is something that we cannot control. There was actually uh, uh, quite a bit of rain after the, you know, the, say the CGR application. You can see the results here, how the base one treated section is performing. 
at the CGR blended section and CGR on uh, applied on top. And uh, you know the results are actually very comparable. And the CGR section actually, based on this uh, lightweight deflectometer test results, show good promising results. And here are the results for seven days after application and 28 days. But keep in mind that it was not possible for us to control the moisture content, but you can see the relative performance of these materials. So CGR sections are doing well compared to the base one, you know, the treated sections. And same thing here, you can see it on the right-hand side, uh, uh, base one, CGR, and a blend, and CGR top. And we also did dynamic cone penetrometer testing. Uh, and uh, you can see the, uh, you know, there's some sections showing uh, uh, lower values uh, uh, and, you know, the about the highest, uh, say, the California bearing ratio was observed uh, based on the rec CGR reclaimed section. And you can see the results, uh, you know, the, throughout the depth of these, uh, you know, the, say, the sections. As you can see, these results are obtained 28 days after application. The key findings from here, and again, please keep in mind that these are preliminary findings, and we will actually continue to go to these test sections and uh, collect results and observe the performance. And we have additional test sections that we will be building next year. And we will again follow the same steps for that test section as well. And the settling the CGR particles uh, is very important for proper field application. And again, we need to know the basic engineering properties of the CGR, uh, and this is needed to, to determine estimate uh, prior to the CGR application. And CGR treatment sections had comparable uh, elastic modulus strength values, uh, you know, based on the base one treated sections. Base one is one of the stabilizers, uh, 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 you know, the ha have a quite a bit of use here in Iowa with our county engineers. And, uh, and again, CGR reclaimed section had higher CBR values, California bearing ratio strength values. And we did not see much impact of the curing, but this is a limited study and, uh, you know, with uh, quite a bit of precipitation taking place during the construction time. So we need more uh, testing and more field test sections to come up with a, uh, you know, final uh, answer on this. Overall summary here is, CGR disposal methods vary quite a bit among different states, and you know the, there are associated concerns to the local environment uh, due to the application of this material, and there are, uh, you know, the, say the lack of detailed guidelines uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the, say the control actions with CGR application, and based on the studies that we've been involved with, uh, especially Minnesota DOT study. Uh, the application rate of uh, slurry lower than 40 ton per acre uh, is not a major concern uh, for the type of soils and plant communities included in, uh, in this study. And uh, CGR stabilization can improve the soil strength and C CGR due to the combination of the flocculation, cement hydration and rehydration and pozzolanic reactions taking place when CGR is mixed with soil particles. And field application requires settling the CGR particles and, you know, the, so that the proper application and the control of this material in the field. And the effects of CGR particle size on soil-based stabilization uh, capabilities are still needed to be evaluated. So we need more research, more work uh, related to these uh, uh, studies. And uh, this concludes my presentation and I will be very happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Jalan. I have a couple questions I'd like to run by. The first one is you indicated in your summary that field application of the CGR for stabilization requires settling the CGG particles. Do you have any thoughts on how this can be done in a production mode? So uh, thank you for your uh, question, uh, Larry. So the uh, CGR contains, uh, you know, the Santo sealed size particles, and based on our uh, uh, field studies, uh, we realized that about 40 minutes uh, will be adequate uh, to, uh, you know, to let the CGR particles uh, settle down, uh, and we realized that 90% of the CGR particles settle within this time period, and again, uh, you know, the 
this will be enough for the say the construction preparation and the transportation of the CGR to the site uh, and you know and then we can actually have the use the uh, direct application of the CGR after it's settled down and again we need to use holding trucks uh, and you know to take the CGR and find a way to properly apply it in the field so handling the CGR a slurry residue and letting it settle down. Those are the steps that we need to follow uh, for, you know, the CDA production modes. And it requires coordination, you know, with the contractors and others involved in the construction site. And we tried our best based on our research study for the applications that we did in Washington County earlier this summer. Thank you. And the next one is you also mentioned in your summary that the effects of the CGR particle size on the stabilization uh, then went on further to say that more research is also needed in this area. When the uh, further research is conducted, is this something that will still have to be considered in the design of each of the field stabilized project stabilization projects? Uh, thank you for this question. Uh, and we do need more research in this area. And uh, and again, the, uh, one of the you know the say the ideas for using CGR. Uh, is to uh, you know the take advantage the reuse the unhydrated uh, uh, po uh, cement particles uh, uh, cement paste uh, as part of soil stabilization you know the city purposes and you know this hydration is you know is a, a slow relatively slow process uh, in in concrete payments it may continue even after 20 years of uh, say the construction and uh, so the finer uh, uh, recycled, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, concrete grinding residue uh, particles, uh, and uh, if you apply them in higher amounts, uh, and we will actually see, a, a, you know, they say the more impact uh, in terms of, uh, say, the soil stabilization. And uh, so the this production of the CGR involves, uh, uh, as you know, the uh, a cooling water uh, requiring, uh, uh, again, a further research in terms of the the how this hydration project uh, process is working with the cgr particles now mixed with the uh, say the soil particles and and again based on our say the laboratory study uh 20 percent uh, addition of the cgr gave us the optimum dosage but again we only looked into two different types of soils uh, here and we need more studies uh, to investigate the linkage between the CGR particles and the optimum application rates by studying, uh, you know, the different uh, soil types, and also seeing, uh, you know, the, say the what actually happens in the long term under the field conditions. Great job. One last question for you. Um, you'd mentioned uh, early on the 40 ton per acre limit. And so the question is, could this be used by all agencies as a limiting criteria, do you think? Yeah, great question. And um, we cannot make a general uh, conclusion here. And uh, so the uh, Iowa State study funded by uh, Minnesota DOT, and we used uh, up to 40 ton per acre. That was the high end limit. Uh, a similar actually study was conducted by uh, in Nebraska, and I believe that their maximum application rate was just about the same, about 40 ton per acre. So what we can say is, is that based on the soil types and the plant communities investigated within these uh, studies, and the maximum limit being 40 ton per acre, we're not seeing a major concern, uh, uh, you know, they say they, within these studies. But obviously, uh, you know, the Nebraska and Iowa are two neighbor states. We need to look into the more soil types, plant communities, uh, different climates, and, you know, the different parts of the country. But I believe that these studies provide a good baseline uh, uh, for future studies, uh, you know, a similar kind in the future, so that other researchers can actually uh, uh, look into similar application rates and then see what kind of impact that they are seeing. And, uh, you know, the results from these uh, uh, different studies can help the uh, IGGA uh, to make a nationwide recommendation uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, the CGR application discharge rates. 
And I believe that we are making good progress, but we do have more work to be done, uh, you know, density on this uh, area. And uh, I also would like to include my uh, uh, contact information here on this slide. If there are any questions from the audience, uh, additional questions uh, when they get the opportunity to watch, view this uh, presentation, uh, uh, please feel free to send me an email and I will be happy to respond to you. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity to be part of your program. Thank you and great job.